Good afternoon. My name is Bethany Maddox, and I'm a member of the customer care team here at Vitech Corporation. I'm very pleased to be your host for this webinar today as we welcome Bill Miller presenting Approximation Analytics for Model-Based Systems Engineering. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical details. First, questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A function in the GoToWebinar window. We will be monitoring these throughout today's event, and we do plan to respond to questions at the end of the webinar, so please send them in. Near the end of the presentation, I'll be picking five attendees to win a copy of our Primer for Model-Based Systems Engineering. Stay tuned for the Q&A session when we'll make that announcement. Finally, the webinar is being recorded today, and an online archive with this presentation will be available within 24 hours of the live version. I believe that takes care of all my housekeeping, so let's get started. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our presenter today. Bill Miller has 40 years of experience at Bell Labs, AT&T, Innovative Decisions Incorporated, and consulting in the conceptualization, modeling, and engineering application of communications and information technologies, systems, and services. This experience has addressed both commercial and government sectors. Bill Miller has managed projects including positions as Chief Systems Engineer and Program Manager. Please join me in welcoming Bill Miller. Okay, thank you Bethany for that introduction. Today I'll be talking uh, about a, a topic that's actually a, a fun topic for me and there's also something I've actually uh, applied uh, over that 40 years and, and found it extremely useful and it's what I call approximation analytics. And we'll be doing it in the context of uh, model-based system engineering or, or what's called FDSC. So in terms of the uh, topics, uh, uh, we have a slide on the abstract uh, that's just in the briefing package for, for completeness. But I'll be talking about the, uh, the layered systems development approach and the opportunity to incur what I call the curse of dimensionality. So we'll, we'll look at that layered approach briefly, talk about dimensionality problems, and then uh, basically get into model-based system engineering, uh, including the, the system modeling language. What I'll then shift to is what I call value models. And value models come from the discipline of decision analysis. A good part of system engineering is about making good decisions and having a rigorous basis for those decisions. And, and decision analysis uh, uh, provides that uh, that, that discipline to, to do those things. And uh, we'll go through a value model uh, uh, methodology. Now, what happens uh, is in making decisions, you often don't have data at hand or uh, information at hand or uh, the information may not be easy to get or it might even be unknowable. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll introduce approximation analytics, and this is especially critical at the beginning of a program before you've done a lot of the modeling, a lot of the analysis to determine if you have a feasible design space. And uh, within approximation analytics, one of the uh, uh, areas of, of uh, application are what are referred to as Fermi problems. Uh, Fermi is named after Enrico Fermi, one of the uh, uh, the people on the uh, U.S. Uh, Manhattan Project during World War II. Uh, then, after we talk about that, we'll just say, okay, what about big data? Big data is the latest, greatest thing. Uh, all that information data is out there, and why can't we just apply that? I'll then get into some uh, examples, uh, one for a complex infrastructure problem, another in aerospace defense, and a third in, in consumer electronics. Then we'll close with a summary. Uh, I've got two slides uh, full of resources, uh, both web-based and, and, and book and paper-based, and, uh, and then contact information if you want to get a hold of me and uh, continue the discussion. And again, uh, toward the end of this, uh, we'll, I guess we'll be doing a Q&A uh, that Bethany will be uh, monitoring. So let's get into it. Uh, uh, first is the abstract, no need to go there, so we'll go to the next slide. Get into this business of layered systems development. Uh, the the system engineering approach that is modeled is typically we use the V model, and it gives the appearance of being a top-down uh, uh, approach uh, for development. Start with uh, some idea of a customer need or deficiency, and then coming up with requirements and architecture, detailed design, and then at the bottom of the V, uh, basically let the designers do their thing. The right side of the V, uh, we start doing unit and integration testing, 
system testing, and then uh, acceptance by the customer. And the, the inference is that this is typically applied to unprecedented systems. Um, the stuff doesn't exist. The reality is uh, a little more complicated than that, is there's a natural part of the human condition is to want to use existing stuff. Can we take existing stuff, legacy stuff, and reuse it, repurchase it, um, and maybe just make a few tweaks or add-ons? And these approaches are called either middle out or bottom up. Um, and you often do a reverse engineering of systems, uh, and this is typically the norm these days. Now, when you do this, it, this is where it raises the, 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 what's called the, the, the curse of dimensionality in terms of level of detail, and I'll illustrate it uh, with the uh, series of next slides, uh, uh, thanks to uh, reuse from uh, permission from uh, Vitech Corporation. Uh, this next slide basically shows uh, a layered system engineering approach for a, for a top-down, unprecedented systems. And you, you, uh, this slide is actually in the, uh, uh, the primer that Vitech uh, has for model-based systems engineering. And we have a high level, level one, uh, with a relatively low level of detail. And at that level one, we work out what are the requirements, what's the behavior, what's the architecture, and we do design verification and validation. And we, of course, have a lot of documents uh, doing that. And then as we drill down, we do a kind of uh, a divide and conquer approach to a level two. Think of those as either the segments or subsystems. And for each of those level two uh, systems, we have to deal with requirements, behavior, architecture, and design verification and validation. But the level of detail we have is, is blown out from the more abstract at the higher level to a, a, a more a higher additional layer of detail. Uh, and then you go down to successive layers, and this diagram only shows uh, uh, down at the bottom of level N, whatever the end layer is, where again at the lowest level you have requirements, behavior, architecture, verification, and validation. <clears throat> and again, the, the amount of detail has exploded by that level. So uh, for top-down unprecedented systems, it's kind of a natural flow of information. Now what happens if we do a middle-out approach? So we'll, we'll go to the next slide. And the middle out is level two. Uh, we're taking things from level at the level two, and we're integrating them differently, tweaking them, and we're coming up with a different level one system. But then we, and then for the lower levels, we'll decompose down to level n. And the issue here, and this is where the start of cursive dimensionality starts to, to arise, is it's very hard. In fact, I've observed this on a lot of programs. It's very hard to abstract thing, a level of detail at a higher level. And so I, have, I show a question mark, and I show about the same level of detail at the higher level, level one, as I do at the level two with a question mark. And it's because it's unlikely there's abstraction that goes on. In fact, what I've seen happen is uh, people tend to get lost in the weeds, and they're dealing with all these existing requirements and documents, and they kind of get lost in them. Uh, and then, of course, as you go down lower, the levels of detail and we'll just finish this sequence up with a, if we were doing a total bottom-up approach, uh, where you have a lot of detail with all the bottom-up stuff that you're integrating together. And again, as you go to higher levels, it, it, it can be hard to abstract to a level of information appropriate for that level. Uh, ten things just tend to bubble up. Uh, so again, the level of detail. And so this is where we're referring to as the curse of dimensionality and being able to cope with all of that. Okay, so uh, uh, some of the realities of uh, dealing with middle out and, and bottom up and development of systems. So uh, the, those uh, trad the traditional approach has result resulted in a lot of documentation, and uh, so the uh, uh, we're evolving toward a model based approach for system engineering. And basically, the concept, the main concept, is to replace that documentation with models. Um, and that these models be integrated to, to uh, together. And so there might be text-based models, graphical models, where we have things like function flow block diagrams, uh, mathematical analysis, simulation models, uh, error checking models, models to visualize. And uh, the, the, uh, the levels of, for, in terms of the implementation of model-based system engineering, we've actually done what's called partial replacement of uh, this basically existed since the 1970s, 
with beginning for automated using automated support tools for things like n-squared diagrams, block diagrams. And the, the current goal is to have a sufficient level of integration uh, to produce documents on the fly for requirements, architecture, interfaces. And the, this uh, way out in the distant future, there's this vision that we, you know, people would like to be able to conduct business uh, with a completely set of integrated models and, and, and no documents. We'll, we'll see if we really get there or not. But that's kind of like the, the vision out in the future. Uh, in terms of model-based system engineering, itself, um, the idea is to have a broad integrated suite of tools uh, to create and communicate all of the information needed. And ultimately, we have to be integrated with uh, what's called model-based engineering, which in itself is still in its infancy. Uh, I'd say there's a healthy uh, a dialogue and controversy in this within the system engineering community now as to whether or not, when we say model-based system engineering, we mean the system's modeling language that is uh, uh, basically a, it's an object management group OMG standard. It's an extended subset of the unified modeling language UML for software. Now, uh, so healthy discussion uh, about that. Uh, there can be other approaches for model-based system engineering with domain-specific models. And uh, there's also a tremendous amount of uh, inertia in the community for adoption of MBSC in particular, I'm sorry, in general, and systems modeling language in general, where in our industries that are often domain specific, we've got existing models, perhaps of different fidelities, existing people trained in certain methods, processes, tools in place. So you have, things just doesn't turn on, on, on a dime. Okay. Uh, in terms of model-based system engineering, I'm showing this next slide the uh, the kind of the, the system engineering V. And the focus so far in model-based system engineering has been on the left-hand side of the V. Uh, very little on the right in terms of integration and test. Not that it can't be done or the tools can be used, but again, the emphasis is more on the, the left-hand side. And in fact, I'm working on additional papers dealing with the whole concept of uh, model-based integration of tests, and there's some great work that's out there uh, that's leading the way on that. Okay, uh, one other area I want to mention is DARPA, the, the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. They have a program called META, and META is not an acronym, it's a name. And what they've been doing is looking at the schedule growth and cost growth of defense and aerospace programs uh, over the years. And the chart that they uh, show is what's here is on the x-axis. Well, by the way, this is a log-log scale. Uh, remember those from your engineering days, engineering college days. Uh, and on the x-axis, they use an admittedly poor uh, metric for complexity of systems. And that metric they use is a summation of parts count plus source lines of code. And on the y-axis is the development period. Uh, in months. And for defense and aerospace systems, we're approaching 20 years to develop these things. Uh, look at some back in time, the Comanche helicopter, the uh, RAH-66, for example. Uh, and the thing diagram also shows when we've invoked various things like mill standards, uh, IC design flows, automotive design flows. And in fact, the um, growth in cost and schedule for aerospace and defense is contrasted with the development periods for automobile intervals, I'm sorry, for automobiles and integrated circuits. Integrated circuits has basically remained flat in the band shown. And automo automotive technology has actually decreased and probably asymptoted out now in terms of the, the, the cycle. And the, the goal of the meta program is to reduce the development interval uh, for uh, aerospace and defense systems by a factor of five, uh, to get it back down to that, uh, let's say, four to five year period. Uh, and what they're doing is they're taking a model-based approach. This is also playing into a bigger program called uh, uh, Adaptive Vehicle Make uh, program using th techniques such as crowdsourcing and so on. So a pretty interesting area to, to be following. But anyway, so that, that's going on also. And they're relying on a lot of specific domain models uh, in this DARPA initiative. Okay, continuing with the DARPA program, DARPA attributes the issue in the growth in cost and schedule for defense systems and aerospace systems 
for what they consider to be a 1960s vintage system engineering process that may have been fine uh, in the early days of the uh, Cold War, the 1950s and 1960s. But as complexity of systems has increased, that process they view as um, inappropriate today. And the techniques they're looking at are basically to uh, 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 test the thing, or, or, or the designs be correct by design is the, is the concept that, that's being used. Uh, so stand by for uh, and DARPA. And by the way, there's a lot of stuff that DARPA has published on this material off their websites. So a lot of information is there. Okay, uh, I want to shift over to the 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 area of analytics in model-based system engineering. Uh, analytics is basically crunching the numbers. Uh, you know, we talk about in MBSC of, for example, functional requirements. Uh, you know, we have functions, inputs, outputs, or we might have an object-oriented approach. I think both are considered. But how well do things happen? How much do we need in the way of resources? And uh, in terms of throughput, bandwidth, uh, uh, how many uh, items of something are needed in a, in a, in a system? And so uh, the, the ENCODE, the International Council on System Engineering, uh, back in 2007, produced a document that's available called System Engineering Vision 2020. Uh, by the way, I don't know, just as an advertisement, uh, COSI is currently uh, beginning work on collaboration with other organizations for a System Engineering Vision 2025 uh, that's in process. But anyway, back to the previous document. Uh, proposed research topics regarding analytics. Uh, basically, they proposed work in multidimensional mathematical model management. Uh, using graph theory and constraint theory, uh, evolutionary computation, genetic algorithms to search vast trade spaces for satisfying designs, uh, quantitative risk management computations based on decision theory to look at that balance of stakeholder uh, preferences on cost, uh, performance, and risk, and then finally value and preference models to translate those stakeholder requirements and risk assessments uh, for verification and acceptance. So some high-level areas, uh, very intense mathematics, uh, and so on. So uh, looking at, let's leverage our computing capability and the uh, Moore's Law uh, with an additional computing, computing cap, uh, capability over the 18 months, two years, to, to work solving these, these large-scale uh, analytic problems. OK. Now, so what's, what's the reality of where we are from that vision for, for analytics? Uh, I'll get into some systems modeling language things. Uh, system L uh, defines a construct, for what they call a parametric diagram. We'll show that uh, in a moment here in terms of the, uh, the ontology for diagrams and specific examples out of the OFG standard. Uh, but what I've seen so far is modeling in parametrics tends to be at the lower realm and a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, uh, it tends to be done in the design space. Uh, and I've seen examples of parametric models of, of, of a flange, for example. So stuff kind of down in the weeds as opposed to the system level kinds of analytics. Uh, now there also are third party add-on parametric solvers uh, to look for, search for maxima and minima. Uh, and anybody that uh, has had any background in, in optimization knows that there's a problem when you have complex nonlinear systems that you might find yourself in, uh, quickly uh, reaching a local optimum, not necessarily the global. And so that's an issue. And by the way, there's a lot of work going on in global optimization. I don't think we're there yet in terms of these uh, parametric solvers. Now, there's some other model-based approaches uh, that I talked about earlier uh, uh, where you have legacy models. Now, the problem with legacy models is you have different vintages of models. You know, it might be models that were coded in Fortran versus, uh, uh, I think another language besides C, uh, I can't think of another one, but a, a, APL, a programming language. Uh, different domains, uh, so uh, the way that electrical engineers model might be different from the way mechanical engineers model. Uh, models will have different fidelities. Uh, and then uh, groups have been attempting to integrate these different models with wrappers such as MATLAB. Uh, to interface to different models to get them to exchange information. And uh, uh, a lot of work has been going on in that in contrast to attempting to use SysML. Now, uh, SysML may be a potential wrapper 
Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that. And then finally, the, the DARPA Meta Program. Uh, one of the things that's come out of the Meta Program, uh, I, I'm looking for corroboration, uh, but the uh, uh, again, if to to the, to if the purpose of the Meta Program, or one of the key purposes, is to prove that models uh, uh, are correct by design. Uh, says that it has to be a lot of modeling and sim analysis, sim simulation and analysis. And uh, I've heard some information over the past couple of years that the number of states that can be tested has increased from 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 15. I'm, I'm looking for corroboration. Now, of course, when you're testing that number of states, it's automated test cases, not, not manual tests. So uh, there's some work going on there. So that's basically kind of the landscape of where we are with analytics. Uh, in terms of the taxonomy for the systems modeling language diagrams, uh, this slide shows the uh, taxonomy of the diagrams. I've circled the parametric diagram because that's the one that we're interested in. Um, and uh, uh, we'll just move on from there in terms of the parametric diagram. Uh, it's, it's basically a specialized internal block diagram that shows constraint relationships between blocks and internal properties or parts. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but I'm looking at applying Vitek Core, uh, uh, basically the uh, uh, internal, or I'm sorry, the block diagram, well actually do IBDs, things like that with the system all diagrams, to, to see to what extent to, to, to is, is core, can Core handle uh, parametric diagrams in, in a system L sense, even though uh, there's currently not an advertised parametric diagram in the core. We have use case diagrams, sequence diagrams, uh, activity diagrams, and various block definition and, and, and internal block diagrams. Uh, the idea of the parametric diagram is to basically, from a system level perspective, is to specify system design and architectural constraints. They're useful for that. But they should also be used for specifying what are the trade studies. Uh, laying out the trade study space uh, for where decisions have to be made. Okay, so let's get into some example uh, parametric diagrams. And the, these, this, this, these next three slides are out of the OMG SysML standard. The example they use in the SysML standard is a uh, hybrid sport utility vehicle. So this is a parametric diagram for the economy context. Uh, for that, and you see things like uh, regeneration brake efficiency equation, aerodynamic drag equation, straight line vehicle dynamics, rolling friction equations, total weight, uh, fuel efficiency equation, and it shows the inner relationships. And you see there's a, a basically a nonlinear complex model that we have to play with. And of course, you can put numbers in and, and get results, but you know, how do you do purposeful design given those dynamics and, and what's achievable? Uh, you, when you to, ver to validate requirements, for example, there should be an underlying model that says, yeah, we can achieve this in terms of the set of requirements for things like fuel efficiency, weight, uh, payload. How, how, what are those traits? Uh, this next slide uh, is an example of vehicle dynamics for the uh, hybrid sport utility vehicle. It basically shows the equations for position, velocity, acceleration. Uh, from your uh, uh, basic physics, uh, you should, you know, simple integration there, uh, or differentiation, depending which direction you're going. And there's a related to a power equation. So you can lay, you can model these out with the parametric uh, diagram. And the third diagram I want to show is more of an overall higher level measure of effectiveness. So the overall MOEs, there's an overall cost effectiveness metric that's a uh, summation of the weights of the different criteria, which here are economy, acceleration, capacity, and unit cost. Uh, so some performance measure of those times weight, you sum that up, and uh, the higher the value, or the, the, uh, the arithmetic value, the higher the, the value of a particular set of traits. And uh, so this is just to illustrate that you can model in this parametric diagram a uh, uh, a trade space. Okay, so let's shift from the system L diagrams to what I call a value model for trade studies. And this is basically an application of decision analysis. And basically, you identify a fundamental objective. What's the most basic high level objective that the stakeholders want to achieve? Uh, a qualitative value model is just basically asking the stakeholders what they want uh, qualitatively. 
um, and then identifying a value hierarchy. What's the hierarchical, hierarchical representation of that uh, model? And there's some criteria about the goodness of the hierarchy. Uh, criteria get at things like completeness, that there's no redundancy, the model is decomposable, that it's operable, and small size is important. And the reason about small size is that in a trade space, usually there's a few key drivers uh, that really drive the, 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 the preferable, uh, the space of preferable solutions. Uh, it, again, that's based on, on, on some amount of experience. A uh, value function, uh, basically it's mathematical functions assign values to uh, things like weight, volume, uh, whatever else we're measuring. Uh, an important piece of uh, property of uh, value is the value should be independent of one another. That is, the value scores of one value measure should not depend on the value scores of other value measures. However, we know from an underlying model that if we're trading off fuel economy versus weight, uh, versus speed, there, there are uh, complex nonlinear relationships uh, uh, between those. So that, that is, a, from my perspective, a challenge. Uh, weights, you have a weight for each value measure or criterion, which you sum to one. And then uh, you define a quantitative value model, you take the qualitative model and quantify it. And uh, the next slide shows an example is uh, you have a set of criteria, such as vehicle fuel economy and so on. Each has a weight, the weight's sum to one. The additive value, V, is the summation of the weights times the value of the individual components. I noted that more is better, the higher the V, the, the better. And then for any single criteria or value, uh, on the right-hand side of the chart, uh, we basically show what a value model like, might look like. So the x-axis in all cases is the uh, specific range of something. So if I have uh, uh, mileage, if I want mileage to range from uh, minimum uh, 10 miles per gallon to a maximum 30 miles per gallon, it, it would be 10 to 30. More is better. So you would say see it increasing from left to right. And you would model that either as a straight line, uh, an exponential, either concave or convex, or a logistics curve uh, like function. Uh, there are cases where less is better, such as typically uh, uh, often a lot of the systems, uh, the less weight, the better. Uh, so uh, you want to, you know, uh, less weight has more value than uh, more weight. Uh, so in that case, the, again, the relationships could be linear, convex, concave, or, or a representative of the logistics curve. Uh, it's interesting with the logistics curves is there tends to be a sweet spot of uh, you know, what we call the knees of the curve, if you've heard that term before, where it's just kind of an optimal place to be operating from. Okay, so this is just a little bit of decision analysis. Uh, and uh, so let's now go into relating those earlier system L diagrams I showed for the HSUP. On the left here, I show the diagram for the economy and the diagram for uh, straight line vehicle dynamics. And I relate it to the measures of effectiveness diagram on the right of the slide, showing some uh, squiggly arrows uh, for acceleration, acceleration model and the fuel economy model that you would relate to. And then things like capacity and cost, unit cost equation, you would have separate parametric diagrams for that. And that would all roll up and you could then do that. Now, the question is, early on in the development of the system, you may not have those more detailed models. You may have a value model. In fact, you often do have a value model. One of the early uh, things you do in early development is coming up with a, a, a value or model. Uh, but you may not have the detailed behavioral models to see whether or not you can get there. Uh, so you're often relying on subject matter experts and things like that, but you don't really have the, the validation early on. So what do you do uh, to, to address that? And this is where approximation analytics comes in. Uh, a, uh, another term for approximation analytics would be back of the envelope calculations, things you do on a napkin over some drinks uh, uh, after work. And uh, basically, what you do with the uh, back of the envelope calculations is you want to estimate and bound system attributes. And you can do this either top down, middle out, or bottom up for developments. Uh, approximation is appropriate when you don't have enough time, data is unavailable or unknowable. Uh, also, there's an important characteristic here where the inherent uncertainty uh, 
in the process early on does not warrant precision. Uh, we'll talk about two approaches here. One is called orders of approximation, and the other is uh, are, are, are things that are referred to as Fermi problems. Again, named in honor of Nico Fermi. Okay, so first orders of approximation. Uh, we often talk, you may have heard people say, I've got an estimate to zero at the order. Uh, basically, that's an initial guess based on some simplified assumptions. And the answer is stated with an order of magnitude to zero significant figures. I'm going to use a running example here of the population of Chicago. Uh, in fact, that's, Chicago is an interesting Fermi problem, uh, or a classic Fermi problem. Uh, so if I am estimating the population of Chicago to zero significant figure, I would say it's in, in the millions. So it's, you know, uh, 10 to the, uh, the sixth. A first order approximation would be one significant figure at an order of magnitude based on simplified assumptions. Mathematically, you could represent this as a linear approximation. And so I'll say uh, that the population of Chicago is 3 million. That would be a first order approximation. Second order approximation, you state two or more significant figures at an order of magnitude. And you can basically mathematically fiddle around with fitting equations using quadratic polynomials, geometric parabolas, polynomials of degree two. And so, again, with our example of Chicago, a second order uh, estimate of the population of Chicago might be 2.67, or I'm sorry, 2.6 million people, uh, as opposed to 3 million people earlier at the first order approximation. And then there are higher order uh, approximations, any, which would be anything from third order on up. Uh, and uh, you would have uh, more detailed mathematical models. The higher order approximations basically are appropriate when you need more fidelity in your system. You're at a stage where fidelity uh, uh, precision is, becomes important. Okay, so let's uh, let's in, let's play around with some Fermi problems. Uh, okay, uh, the idea with Fermi problems is making justified guesses with little or no data. Uh, basically, you estimate solutions by multiplying a series of estimates. And each estimate uh, can have a, a, a range of possible values. Uh, the way Fermi addressed this was to use the geometric mean. So if I have uh, a range from, I'll do a simple example, uh, if I got two variables, uh, or a variable with a range from 1 to 4, the geometric mean is the 1 times 4 is taking the square root, which is 2. Uh, which is different than the mean of 1 plus 4, which is uh, 2 and a half. Uh, the approach works when the estimation of individual terms are close to correct, and overestimates or underestimates cancel each other out. In other words, there's no bias one way or the other. Uh, there's a mathematical basis for all of this related to linear processes and random walks. And uh, I give an example here. If you have uh, 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 nine estimates that you multiply each other, uh, the estimate tends to the logarithm of three, so that a factor of two under or overestimating, which you get would get you within an order of magnitude of the right answer. So a Fermi uh, a solution is viewed as being correct if it is within an order of magnitude, one direction or the other. Uh, some example uh, Fermi problems, one of his classic ones is es he estimated the yield of the first nuclear device at the Trinity's test site in New Mexico on July 16, 1945. And uh, basically, they had the, 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 the test was well instrumented, but Fermi didn't want to wait for the, all the data production and analysis. So he was at a safe standoff distance from the, uh, the explosion. And what he did was before, during, and after the explosion, he dropped pieces of paper. And he basically eyeballed the displacement of the paper on the ground and used that as the basis for estimating the yield. He came up with an estimate of yield of the device of 10 kilotons, which was close within the definition of what's acceptable to the approximate 20 kilotons that the data reduction and analysis uh, showed later. Uh, another classic Fermi problem is, here we're back to Chicago, estimate the number of piano tuners in the city of Chicago. Uh, some other examples would be estimate the number of cell phones in use at any time on the planet, or estimate the number of ga gallons of fuel consumed by automobiles in the USA in a year. Uh, I've got a uh, link here to the University of Maryland has a uh, Fermi problem site uh, that has uh, problems and, and solutions. It's, a, it's a kind of a fun thing uh, to do. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so let's actually go through the Fermi problem on the number of piano tuners in Chicago. Assume 3 million population. Turns out from the 2010 census, about 2.7 million. Assume on average two people per household. Assume one household in 20 has a piano regularly tuned. Uh, regularly tuned pianos are tuned once a year. It takes a piano tuner two hours to tune a piano, including travel time. And the, your average piano tuner works eight, or eight hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, which is about approximately 1,000 piano tuners a year. When you chunk through the math in this, with this particular set of uh, uh, parameters, I come up with 75 piano tuners in the city of Chicago. And I've seen other examples of like 125 and so on, depending what, what numbers you do. But it's viewed as being with correct in an order of magnitude. Um, okay, so uh, before I actually get into some examples here, oh, let's, let's do, uh, before I continue here, I've actually applied this. Uh, most, uh, not as most recently, but back, uh, for example, in 2000, I was working on a ship system. And one of the subsystems I was working on uh, had mass storage. And we ended up going through a trade study and selecting array technology, but you know, how many terabytes of storage were we going to need? And as you might expect, the ship has certain things on it, certain sensors, things you want to record. And uh, so I went around to the different teams that were, uh, that were responsible for the different kinds of things you could record. Let's say if a ship has a sonar on it, for example, uh, gee, what kind of data are you going to be generating and how much are you going to store? And their answer came back, we don't know, we're, we're de designing it now. Uh, so I basically went back to first principles of all the stuff and uh, built uh, estimates of all the stuff that was in development, uh, basically created the mother of all spreadsheets, or, uh, basically oriented around a concept of operation of the ship leaves port, ship goes, does its thing, ship returns to port. And uh, came up with an estimate, slap margin on it, and the answer was 6.8 terabytes. Uh, that value lasted all the way through the development. Uh, turns out, as, you know, as things occurred, uh, and if always came in, things tended to cancel out, and the answer stayed the same. So just, you know, I, I, I'm very comfortable with this, uh, uh, this approach. <clears throat> okay, what about big data? Uh, there was a recent article in last year in Harvard Business Review that this is drawn from, and I've got it cited in the references. Uh, big data, you're often subject to garbage in, garbage out analytics. Uh, one example, a key example, is the financial meltdown in 2008 by financial houses that had all these fancy computer programs that uh, did risk measure uh, assessment on, based on the leverage they had. Uh, and uh, there was a big underlying assumption of normal distributions as opposed to fat tail distributions. Hey, normal distributions are great because it's, the math is relatively simple uh, to do. Uh, so, uh, uh, we had much longer tail distributions, and uh, we know what the result was. And a lot of, uh, in fact, the article says there's really not enough people that have real skill, analytic skills these days, and that, that's, that's a real problem. Uh, third concern is that IT organizations are more, more focused on the technology and not the information. Uh, reliable information may exist, but it can be hard to find, which requires you to do what I euphemistically refer to going on treasure hunts. Uh, treasure hunt is something's out there, and I'm not spending a lot of time googling and looking through archives and company files and things. Uh, and you spend a lot of time going on treasure hunts. You know, there's got to be, got to be there something, got to be there something. Uh, and I, my suggestion there is an alternative is to do a quick back of the envelope, uh, and then as you get time and the, this information comes in, uh, validate that. Uh, and then it was interesting. Harvard Business Review actually had a comment, an editorial comment on their part. They felt that managers and executives were better at managing talent, capital, and brand, but not too good at managing information, which was an interesting observation that I can kind of agree with based on a few observations. So big data. Okay, let's get into a couple, well, three examples now of, uh, of doing this. Uh, for a complex infrastructure example, uh, one is cell tower coverage in the lower 48 states of the US. Uh, turns out we'll assume GSM technology uh, turns out for GSM, the range of cell phone tower spacing is about a quarter of a mile to 22 miles. 22 miles is based on technical limitations of the GSM standard for these little portable handsets. They have to have enough uh, power to, to transmit a signal, and that's where it comes in at. The quarter mile is based on population densities and numbers of people that are trying to be on uh, concurrently, so traffic limit. 
So the geometric mean of the tower spacing is the square root of 0.25 times 22 miles, and about two miles, the, which gives you the average cover of a cell tower, pi r squared. Rather than using the two miles, I just use the, the existing 0.25 times 22, uh, because I just take, you know, if I square root of something, then I'm squaring it back to the original product. And, and that ends up being about 17 miles squared for the area. Uh, the area below were 48 states. Uh, I'm just looking at the map and just thinking, uh, uh, ballpark it, uh, 3, 000, we're 3,000 miles across and 1,000 miles down. So that's about three times 10 to the six miles squared. So the estimate of towers is the area of the lower 48 divided by 17 square miles per tower. It comes in at 176,000 towers. I actually found a website after I did the calculation that said the actual number of towers is about 190,000 in the U.S. Uh, by the way, I did not include Alaska or Hawaii in this. I didn't try to Google to try to find out towers by state, but uh, again, I saw it. I was quickly getting into a treasure hunt. And it was going to take all night. I uh, uh, found some additional data that the construction cost of a tower these days is about 150,000. So with that 176,000 towers, about 26 billion in capital investment. So that kind of gives you an idea for uh, a complex infrastructure problem. Uh, for an aerospace defense example, I'm um, using the off-road mobility of a combat vehicle. And uh, uh, this, there's a lot of information on this. I'll kind of go counter, well, I'll, well top row first. Uh, right hand, upper right quadrant, the kind of a diagram of a combat vehicle. Uh, vehicle weight 50 to 65 tons. By the way, this is actual data out of a uh, uh, Congressional Budget Office study for Army program that's in development. Uh, turns out, okay, so they're talking about a range of 50 to 65 tons. Uh, turns out anybody that knows anything about trafficability knows that the ideal weight for trafficability is to be under 40 tons. And a lot of it has to do with bridge design, uh, infrastructure design. Uh, the, the infrastructure has to support uh, uh, the heavy load. So uh, uh, that means something that's 50 to 65 tons will have difficulty moving in certain parts of the planet. Okay, on the upper left, uh, basically there's four key parameters. Uh, capacity of the, the vehicle has a weight of 10% in the weighting criteria, uh, according to CBO. And that capacity, they'd like to hold 12 soldiers, crew of three plus nine uh, additional soldiers. Survivability to a host of uh, things, including IEDs and explosively formed penetrators these days, 40%. Lethality, because it has weapons on it, 30% against a target set. And mobility of 20%, including things like transportability, that's getting it to where you want to operate it. Traffic ability is running it over the terrain. Uh, road performance and off-road performance. Lower left is a set of uh, parameters and functions and, and estimates. Uh, so we want to really compute energy, which is force times distance. Uh, just by the way, fuel, JP, they use kerosene, Army uses kerosene uh, blend, and uh, JP8, I think, or JP5, I forget which one. Uh, but roughly there's three times 10 to the 7 joules per liter, and you can think in terms of about four liters per gallon. F is force. Uh, D is distance. Well, this, for this calculation, will be one mile, about 1,500 meters. Uh, the vehicle aerodynamic factor, this is a vehicle with a frontal area, uh, that's uh, going, you know, resisting uh, uh, the air as it moves. Uh, vehicle aerodynamic factors are over a range of zero to one, and uh, I'll say this vehicle is about 0.5, kind of similar to like a uh, semi tractor trailer of about 40 tons. Uh, density of aero is important, that's one kilogram per cubic meter. Front area of the vehicle uh, is, is about 16 meters squared, it's about four by four meters. Uh, velocity of the vehicle, when we're going cross country or uh, uh, off road performance, typically we'd op like to operate anywhere from zero to 30 miles per gallon, or sorry, 30 miles per hour, and which is equivalent to zero to 13 uh, meters per second. Uh, engine efficiencies are about 25%. Uh, the weight is 50 to 65 tons, so the geometric mean of that is 57 tons or equivalent newtons is 57 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Uh, ground resistance is anywhere, depending upon the nature of the ground, for anywhere from 2 to 10 percent of weight. Uh, by the way, over paved roads, it's about 1 percent of weight. 
uh, geometric mean of ground resistance about 2.6 times 10 to the 4 uh, newtons, and that dominates the 7 times 10 to the 2 newtons for air resistance drag, which is basically the equations shown. Uh, so when we look at forces, the first order, it's based on the ground resistance. Um, for the engine, or the energy required, since the energy efficiency is 25%, which would multiply by 4 times the distance of 1 mile, would be 15 times 10 to the 7 joules. Fuel efficiency is that energy amount divided by the energy in a gallon or liter of fuel, which translates to about five liters, or roughly one mile per gallon, which is, again, in the ballpark for experience with existing combat vehicles of that size. Uh, uh, some notes of further continuing the model, uh, there's actually tremendous fuel usage for acceleration. So if I'm going uh, from zero to 30 miles per hour uh, in a given amount of time, that'll, that'll burn up about a gallon. Uh, and also, the vehicle needs to uh, deal with grades of up to 60% for the requirement set, and that will also reduce mileage. And again, there's models that exist for that, but I wanted to give you an idea of how you quickly could develop these kinds of things. So there's an inherent trade here uh, between vehicle weight uh, uh, because of the mobility, uh, traffic ability issues, uh, fuel economy, uh, capacity. There's a trade between, in fact, the Army's kind of wrestling with that now. We can get the weight down under 40 tons if we reduce the amount of soldiers we carry around. Uh, but then we need more vehicles. And then you need to look at uh, uh, lethality. Can we take certain weapons off and get away with not dealing with the whole target set, but just an important subset of the target set. So the Army is really struggling with this right, uh, right now in terms of trying to find a feasible design space. And the idea here is to show how approximation analytics uh, uh, can, can help you kind of zero in on what's the sweet spot for design, given the, the maturity of the technologies that we have. A uh, third example I have for consumer electronics uh, was, let's go back to the initial iPhone uh, back in uh, early 2000s uh, when Steve Jobs announced it. One of the big controversial things is the first iPhone used a 2.5G, what was referred to as 2.5G technology called Edge, as opposed to 3G. And I have a quote down at the bottom from Steve Jobs. And the graphic on the chart shows on the left is the, the motherboard layout for the iPhone with the GSM Edge chipsets in purple versus the uh, competitor phone at the time. It was the Blackjack. Their motherboard layout in terms of real estate, real estate and the, the chipsets for uh, the communications part in, in red. And Jobs said, the chipsets aren't integrated well enough It'll be too much of a power draw, too big of a physical uh, space required. So we'll, we'll wait until the 3G technology matures, which, which is what they did. But they got some amount of heat from that. Which is, so uh, to basically, to, to validate jobs, I basically did some analysis on uh, actual data. So I'm showing in the upper table uh, relevant smartphone design details using from survey data, looking at the iPhone, the Blackjack, the BlackBerry 8800 and the TRIO phone back in that era in terms of various things. And I derived in the lower chart uh, network battery weight volume model from the survey data. And basically what we saw was that for internet use time, uh, comparing the blackjack to the iPhone, you would draw down your battery in about, uh, about half an hour, a little over half an hour. With the iPhone, you had about six hours of battery use. So it basically, the sense was that people preferred uh, network interconnect time, internet connect time, over uh, throughput uh, as, a, as, a, as a preference. So again, this was, uh, these, this lower table were derived estimates, order of magnitude kinds of things uh, to come up with those estimates for uh, weight and volume and internet use time and, uh, for different data rates. Okay, uh, summary. Uh, approximation analytics provides initial rapid assessment of feasibility in early development. Uh, I think it's extremely important or valuable to DOD in early what they call development planning. It complements your value modeling in that decision analysis approach in trade studies. It's useful for higher level of abstraction and development. And probably more, most importantly, it provides a sanity check against the more detailed, higher fidelity models uh, as a kind of sanity check against where we, we have a garbage in, garbage out situation. Okay, I've got two uh, uh, slides here of, uh, of data, and I want to go to the second slide. Uh, in terms of if you're interested in these uh, um, 
concepts of like Fermi problems. Uh, uh, items 10 through 13 uh, are websites, and uh, we'll deal with this. And then there's two books on guesstimation, uh, references 14 and, uh, and 15 that are useful. And finally, oops, the uh, last slide, my contact information, if I can get there. Oops, I can't. Uh, let me back up. Get there and then get back to it. And with that, we will, uh, uh, Bethany, turn it back to you for uh, questions. Thank you, Bill. Let's go ahead and move on to questions from the audience. We do have a few great questions already. Thank you to those who submitted them. I encourage everyone to join the discussion. Submit your questions at any time using the questions and chat function in the GoToWebinar window. Let's get started, Bill. Our first question is from Lindsay. And Lindsay asks, aren't systems today so complex that simplification of parameters and their interactions lead to inaccurate results and wrong decisions? Yeah, uh, it gets back to uh, the statement that, yeah, systems are complex, they're nonlinear. Uh, we have to be careful about small world phenomena, but it's important early on in the development to say, is there a feasible design space? And the idea is to get within an order of magnitude of that and not just hang on your law, you know, rest on your laurels at that point, but have that be a basis that you would get that, that level of detail more appropriately as you get more into the development where the fidelities will become important. Uh, but again, it can, can serve as a useful check. And as you get in different, if, as you gain additional information, you can refine these uh, back of the envelope calculations uh, as, as you proceed. So uh, again, my experience base referring to that ship system, uh, we had all kinds of puts and takes, and the models that I used at first for different sensors, things that were recording, were real basic. Uh, but after all the puts and takes, the answer remained the same. And I, this has happened on several programs. So anecdotally, my experience has been uh, uh, in line with the prediction that, uh, that Fermi's made, that it, the, basically the process is kind of a wiener process, a random walk, that you do converge to a, to a solution. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, my next question is from Carolyn, and she asks, approximation analytics seems deterministic in approach. How do you deal with uncertainties, including black swan events? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, some favorite books, on, uh, in fact, I'll put my favorite book by this is Sam Savage, who has a book out called The, the Flaw of Averages. It, it's a great read. And Sam says you need to be, to be concerned about at, where are you at the tails of the distribution. Uh, approximation analytics is a good first step to see where's the ballpark. Are we in the ballpark? But then uh, I, would, you know, the, I would have another talk about uh, modeling uh, the tails of distributions for those uncertain events. So this is a, a necessary but not sufficient approach, I would say. Okay, one last question from Garrett, and before I ask that, I'll remind everyone if you have a question, go ahead and send it in, it's not too late. And Garrett is asking, at what stage in development does approximation analytics break down? Ah, okay. It, it, easy, that's, that's an easy one. It goes back to that orders of approximation chart I showed, zeroth order approximation, first order, second order. When you need to be at a level of, of detail where you're down in the weeds of a third order approximation or more is probably where it starts to break down. But, but what you've done is you've bought time to develop those, uh, if you don't already have them at hand, develop those uh, uh, more detailed models, or at least get them calibrated. Or if you've got existing models, you often need to uh, uh, go back and revalidate the models for the, the reuse. Uh, this this reminds me of uh, of, uh, uh, of a, a quick back of the envelope that, that could have been done. Uh, there's a famous case of the uh, European rocket, the Ariane Ariane Five, I think it was Ariane Five. Uh, it was a scale up of the Ariane Four. Um, the there's tremendous data out there, case study on this. It's all out there, and in that program, uh, uh, they took what I refer to as a high guts to brains ratio and felt they didn't have to do testing uh, because things had already been qualified on the area four. 
And let's say it was a bad day on launch for the Area 5 with a, with a, with a real payload that got blown up uh, when they had to abort the, uh, the launch. Uh, what happened was the, uh, the guidance computers they were using, 16-bit uh, uh, fixed arithmetic, qualified for the Arian 4 program, ended up incurring a uh, overflow condition on the 16-bit arithmetic for the Arian 5. The forces were greater than uh, what the, the computer was qualified to. Uh, turns out the good news was the code was written in ADA, so ADA put out a message on an overflow condition. The main onboard computer uh, only ever assumed it was getting data and not data or messages, so it processed the message uh, as if it were data, and uh, let's say you had some crazy results that uh, uh, resulted in uh, stresses being put on the, 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 the vehicle that started to break it up and that initiated the abort sequence. This would have been a case where uh, a quick back of the envelope uh, could have been done to look at stresses uh, for the Arian 5 as it scaled up and said, okay, where are we with respect to the, uh, uh, the existing computer in terms of what it's qualified to, as this is an example of that. Thanks, Bill. We did have um, another question from Donna, and the last of it's just coming in. Let me finish reading it once over. She's asking, um, is big data just another buzzword? Uh, um, a little more context, um, especially with executive orders coming down to share data between organizations. Yeah, uh, there's, you know, as these things occur, there's always a big amount of hype uh, with, uh, with big data. I know there's tremendous interest in, in, in analytics for that. Uh, I believe there's useful information in there, uh, but probably buyer beware. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, you know, uh, again, with big data, uh, you want to believe the, the data that you get. Uh, I, I would do something like some approximation analytic approach, do a back of the envelope as a cross check. What I'm seeing, does it make sense? Uh, I guess one of the things I'm, 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 I've been concerned with from an engineering perspective is uh, as we've gotten more and more sophisticated computing and uh, with emphasis on things like PowerPoint, uh, I, I'm very concerned that our analytic skills uh, as a society or as a profession have degraded uh, compared to what they used to be. Uh, so uh, I'm basically probably on a crusade to uh, uh, emphasize re-emphasis of uh, or re-emphasize analytic skills as an important part of uh, engineering, including system engineering. And the system engineers have to be capable of doing these kinds of quick calculations uh, to basically as a cross-check against what they're, what they're getting or what they're seeing, whether it's from big data or from the various uh, uh, domains that we, that we interact with in, in, in our work. Okay, thanks, Bill. Well, this wraps up our Q&A for today. If um, anyone has any questions or comments that you didn't send in today, I invite you to post those on the forum of our community site. You'll find that at community.fitechcorp.com. Now it's time to give away a few of our primers. My webinar producer, Ms. Eva Dace, has randomly selected five winners. So the winners are Donna Wilson, Ben Naknak, Brian Anderson, Mark Berg, and Marco Escudero. Eva will email each of you using the address you used when registering for this event so that she can confirm your mailing address. So look for that communication from her. If you would like a copy and did not win, let us know. Just get in contact with our sales team and they will get you a digital copy as soon as possible. I hope you'll join us for the rest of our webinar series, which continues through June. For details and registration, visit our website, fitechcorp.com. In closing, I'd first like to thank you, Bill. I'd especially like to thank all of the attendees for joining us today. As we bring this webinar to a close, a survey will open on your screen, either in a new browser tab or in a new window. Please take a moment to provide us with feedback on today's presentation, as well as what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day.